The battles at Gettysburg. Barksdale's Mississippians are finally let loose. The arrangement of McClaw's division mirrored that of Hood's division. McClaw's was to attack on a two-brigade front with Brigadier General Joseph Kershaw's South Carolina Brigade on the right, supported by Brigadier General Paul Seams' Georgia Brigade. On the left was Brigadier General William Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade, supported by Brigadier General William Wolford's Georgia Brigade. The attack was to be an in echelon formation, with Kershaw advancing first, with Sims following behind him. Kershaw intended to have the center of his brigade strike Stony Hill. Hunt had moved additional federal batteries into position along the Millersville Road that divided the northeast portion of the wheat field from Trossel's Woods. These guns opened fire on Kershaw's South Carolinians, who were passing across their front. Kershaw's three left regiments wheeled north. They passed the stone buildings on the Rose Farm in an attempt to storm the Union guns, but an order to move by the right flank caused the three regiments to veer to the right, away from the enemy guns. The Federal gunners who were preparing to pull their guns out of harm's way now opened up with a vengeance. Hundreds of the bravest and best men of South Carolina fell, wrote Kershaw. They were victims of this fatal blunder. Through the smoke and dust that clouded the field, and the bluecoats on Stony Hill could see in the distance a gray line with battle flags fluttering, advancing towards them. The 17th Maine braced for another attack behind their stone wall. Anderson's Georgians surged forward once again in a bid to capture the wall. Barnes grew deeply concerned over the position of his troops on Stony Hill in the face of McCall's attack. He therefore ordered bro both brigades to withdraw through the Millersville Road and take up a new position in Trossel's Woods. With casualties mounting and Bard's Barnes' two brigades withdrawn, de Trobidan had little choice but to order his brigade to fall back as well. For this reason, the 17th Maine abandoned the stone wall for which they had set, shed so much blood. Winslow's Napoleons continued to hammer away at the, the rebels. The 115th Pennsylvania also poured its fire into Anderson's troops. Minier balls whipped through the wheat stalks, felling horses and gunners as Kershaw's men fired into Winslow's battery. Winslow gave the order to withdraw the guns to Trossel's woods. In a Herculean effort, his men managed to save all six pieces. With the wheat field and rose woods in Confederate hands, the Federals rushed fresh troops to the sector. Brigadier General John Caldwell received orders to march his 1st Division of Hancock's 2nd Corps to support the 5th Corps. Leading the column was Colonel Edward Cross's 1st Brigade. The other brigades, in order of march, were Colonel John Kelly's 2nd Brigade, Colonel John Brooks' 4th Brigade, and Brigadier General Samuel Zook's 3rd Brigade. Cross pushed into the wheat field and about halfway across traded fire with Anderson's Georgians positioned along the edge of Rose Woods. Cross was preparing his men for a charge when a rebel sharpshooter shot him. While Cross was being carried from the field, Sergeant Charles Phelps killed the enemy sharpshooter. Cross succumbed to his wounds the following day. Cross's bluecoats advanced steadily. On their right, the Irish Brigade kept up a spirited fire with its emerald flags flapping, but the advance of Chizook's companies was slowed considerably by the retreating troops of the 5th Corps. If you can't get out of the way, lie down and we will march over you, shouted the Irish Force. Zooks and Kelly's brigades moved against the Greybacks on Stony Hill. They met fierce resistance from Kershaw's South Carolinians. Some men from both the 3rd and 7th Carolina fired at Zook as he rode up the slope of Stony Hill. Minier balls ripped into his shoulder, chest, and stomach, mortally wounding him. Kershaw requested that Sims move his men into the gap between the and his troops. As Sims led his men forward in a charge, he was mortally wounded in the thigh. He died eight days later. The arrival of Caldwell's division overwhelmed Kershaw's brigade. Realizing his men could not hold their position, Kershaw ordered his men to withdraw in stages to the Rock Rose Farm. Confederate prospects worsened when Caldwell sent Brooks' brigade into the fray. Advancing quickly across the wheat field, the Yankees came under enemy fire. Brooke ordered a bayonet charge, which succeeded in evicting Anderson's Georgians from the wheat field. Reaching the western edge of Rose's farm, Brooks' muskets came to a halt as Confederate resistance stiffened. For the time being, the wheat field and most of Rosewoods were back in Federal hands. While Kershaw's and Sims' brigades had advanced, 
Barksdale grew increasingly impatient for Longstreet's signal to send his troops into battle. His brigade was taking casualties from the six Napoleons of Captain John Buckland's Battery B, First Rhode Island Light, as well as two gun section of Captain James Thompson's Pennsylvania Battery on the Sherbrooke Farm. "'I wish you would let me go in, General,' said Barksdale. "'I would take that battery in five minutes, but old Pete would not be rushed.' wait a little we are all going in presently he said barksdale got his orders to advance on the peach orchard barksdale's sixteen hundred mississippians were as anxious to get moving as their commander climbing over a stone wall at the edge of Saint-Sir's woods the men advanced in two lines that stretched for three hundred and fifty yards Barksdale, the fire-eating secessionist former congressman waved a saber over his head and led his men forward they moved with such momentum that they smashed through the wooden fences on both sides of Emmitsburg Road as they advanced. Brigadier General Charles Graham's brigade held the peach orchard. Only four of his six Pennsylvania regiments, totaling 1,000 men, were in position along the Emmitsburg Road to defend against Barksdale's attack. As Barksdale's Magnolia Staters advanced, the Federal artillery blew gaping holes in their ranks. To lessen the time that they had to spend under cannon fire, Barksdale ordered his men to double quick. The Mississippians let out a rebel yell as they rushed toward the enemy. When Barksdale's soldiers came to within 40 yards of Buckland's guns, they halted and fired a deadly volley that felled a good number of horses and gunners. The 114th Pennsylvania Zouaves advanced past the battery as Buckland issued orders to his men to limber up and withdraw to the rear. The 57th and 105th Pennsylvania regiments also advanced. Graham requested aid from two brigades of Humphrey's division nearby that had not yet been engaged. The 73rd New York Zouaves of Colonel William Brewster's 2nd Brigade dashed forward and took up position behind the 114th Pennsylvania. Barksdale's charge swept like a storm over Graham's brigade. Colonel Benjamin Humphreys directed the 21st Mississippi to attack Colonel Andrew Tipton's 68th Pennsylvania, holding the left flank of Graham's brigade in Sherfy's Peach Orchard. Colonel William Holden, 17th Mississippi, joined the attack on the hapless Pennsylvanians by assailing the regiment's right flank. Heavily outnumbered, the 68th Pennsylvania lost half of its men in a matter of minutes. Having smashed the 68th Pennsylvania, Barksdale swept the rest of Graham's brigade from the field. The 57th Pennsylvania, which had been defending the Sherfy farm buildings, broke and fled east toward Cemetery Ridge. Barksdale's men rounded up hundreds of Pennsylvanians from Graham's shattered brigade. One of the prisoners was Graham, who had been wounded by shrapnel and hit the hip and shot in the upper body. Deployed facing south at the Peach Orchard were the three Union regiments from three different brigades. Barksdale's Mississippians were astride the right flank of the line formed by the three regiments. One of these regiments, Graham's 141st Pennsylvania, tried to slow the Confederate advance and lost three quarters of its men in short order. Porter Alexander ordered six Confederate batteries to advance to support McClaw's division. Meanwhile, Barksdale's Magnolia Staters pushed east toward Abraham Trossel's farm, where Sickles had his headquarters. Confederate guns bombarded the Trossel farm. Sickles was riding his battle line when a shell struck his right leg. He had enough presence of mind to order a tourniquet fashioned from a saddle strap. He was whisked away in a wagon. A surgeon amputated his leg just above the knee. When Meade learned that Sickles was out of the battle, he gave Hancock command of Sickles' beaten corps. While Barksdale crushed Graham's brigade, Wolford sought to exploit the gap between Graham's brigade and the Peach Orchard and De Trobodan's brigade on Stony Hill. The arrival of Wolford's Georgians breathed fresh life into the brigades of Kershaw, Sims, and Anderson. The Federals holding Stony Hill and the wheat field were in serious danger of being outflanked. Barnes sent Switzer's brigade to assist Caldwell. Schweitzer's 1,000 Yankees advanced through the wheat field as the hard-pressed troops on Stony Hill began to fall back. The Confederates caught Switzer's brigade in a murderous crossfire, forcing them to withdraw as well. As Caldwell's division withdrew east from the wheat field, Switzer's brigade wound up covering its retreat. Rebels streamed into the tramped wheat and took possession of the field. 
The only Union forces left in good order on the west side of Plum Run were two small brigades of U.S. Army regulars deployed in two lines south of Millerstown Road. They belonged to Brigadier General Roan Ara's division of the Fifth Corps. Farther north Barksdale exhorted his left regiments to press their attack against two brigades of Brigadier General Andrew Humphrey's second division of the Third Corps. Adding weight to his attack were the fresh Alabama regiments of Brigadier General Cadmus Wilcox's brigade of Richard Anderson's division. Colonel Humphrey's 21st Mississippi moved east along Millerstown Road toward four Federal batteries totaling 22 guns facing south. The Federal artillerymen limbered up their guns and rode east as minier balls zipped through the air, felling men and horses alike. Captain John Bigelow's 9th Massachusetts Light Battery was positioned the farthest east. Bigelow knew that once his sixth Napoleon stopped firing, the rebels would be on him. He fired canister that shredded the attacking Confederates. Instead of rolling the guns back into position, he allowed their recoil to move them steadily back. Having reached the Trossel Farm in this manner, he ordered his guns limbered up. It was now 6 p.m., and Barksdale's men were only a quarter mile from Cemetery Ridge. When he reached the Trossel Farm, Bigelow had gained enough distance from the attacking Confederates to limber up his guns. Before they were limbered, Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery, his commanding officer, arrived and ordered him to hold his position at all hazards. Bigelow then ordered his guns to load double canister. McGilvery then rode off to scrape together guns to thwart the Confederate advance toward a three-quarter mile gap on Cemetery Ridge. The Mississippians charged his battery and got among the guns. Bigelow was able to save only two of them. Shortly afterward, Colonel Humphrey halted his Mississippians, having realized they had advanced too far to the front and were unsupported. A short distance to the north, Barksdale was out front, leading his troops as they attacked northeast. Forward, men, forward, he cried, pointing his sword at the Yankees on Cemetery Ridge. When his regimental commanders requested that he break off his attack and regroup, he dismissed the idea. The Mississippians got as far as the west slope of the ridge, but by then Hunt had massed 40 guns to thwart them. Meanwhile, Hancock plugged the gap in his line with Colonel George Willard's brigade of Brigadier General Alexander Hayes' 3rd Division of the 2nd Corps. Willard's New Yorkers launched a vicious counterattack. The 126th New York wanted revenge for having been forced to surrender at Harper's Ferry during the Antietam campaign. They came on shouting, Remember Harper's Ferry! Willard fell in the attack, but his men succeeded in repulsing the Mississippians. Barksdale was mortally wounded trying to rally his men, shot in both legs and the chest. He was captured by the Yankees. He died before morning. Of the 1,600 Mississippians in his brigade, 789 were killed, wounded, or missing after the attack. It's your history. Learn it. Know it. And love it.